I'm doing a very spontaneous market update um, because I felt that right now the market situation is pretty tricky and I just want to make sure uh, as I am navigating through my portfolio, I can also share with you some of my insights over the past uh, one year, okay, year to date, uh, just from this year alone itself, the market has already gone up 10 over percent. All right. And if you check the past one year, the market has actually already gone up 30%. So can you tell me, where do you think is the market heading from here? If you think it's going up, type up. If you think it's going down, type down. If you think that going sideways, type S. Okay. S stands for sideways. Let's take a look at what is the market saying, all right? Because if you look at different statistics, there will be different people sharing about different insights. So let's see for ourselves based on all the statistics that we are going to go through tonight. In fact, later on, I'm also inviting an economy expert, right? He has been really, really consistent to be able to forecast the interest rate very, very successfully for the past few years, right? So I'll be also bringing him in so that he can also share with you some additional insights for you for you to make a better informed decision all right so now let's firstly take a look at what is the bear sayer uh saying all right so now how many of you are familiar with technical analysis if you are familiar with technical analysis type ta this is the s p 500 all right by the way what is s p 500 it represents the U.S. stock market, right? All the great companies, be it whatever things I show you just now, your Apple, Microsoft, Meta, all these are being tracked by this index. So when those companies' stock price goes up, right, the S&P 500, the whole U.S. stock market goes up, right? So guys, can you tell me right now, right, with this chart, can you tell me if the chart looks like it's uh, high, or it's at the low point. Is that the high point or is it at the low point? Eh? This is very obvious, right? Everybody can see, uh, regardless whether you have any technical analysis experience or not, it's definitely at the high point, right? So that's why based on technical analysis as bad of it, when something goes up so high, right? What must, what goes up must eventually come down, right? So how many of you think that actually right now is kind of like a, a little bit shaky? If you think it, the market is a little bit shaky right now, type S in the chat, right? It seems to be going up so high. In fact, it has already broken down, uh, broken up the previous uh, resistance, right? Let me see how do I draw, uh, how am I supposed to draw this? Ah, I can annotate like that, okay? So over here, right, it has, already broken the previous resistance, which is here, right? It's been being broken. And right now, it's all the way up. So very, very likely, all right, the market cannot keep on going, go up forever, right? Just like here, if you go up, eventually you should also come down here, right? So that's why based on the best that you're saying is, well, if the market goes up so high, eventually it should start to come down. And then this is where, uh, when it comes down, then we have to observe whether does it, break up from here, that means this one, it will bounce back or might go down a little bit more, right? This is something that we cannot say for sure, but at least it's giving us some clue of uh, what is happening in the market, right? So, so far, how many of you are clear about this argument? If you are clear, can you type C in the chat? Yeah, some of you say it's a little bit too stretched, right? Ian said, right? Yeah, it's too stretched means it just gone up too much, right? So this is pretty clear, right? Now, the next thing is, all right, let me go back to the next slide. The next thing is, let's look at the Schiller P-E ratio. Now, if you're wondering what is P-E ratio or what is Schiller P-E, basically, it's how it gives you an indication of how expensive or how cheap the market is. Now, let's take a look at firstly, what is Schiller P-E ratio? Basically, the P earning, price earnings, P E ratio stands for price slash earnings, right? It's based on an average inflation adjusted earnings from the previous 10 years. So when you use Schiller P E ratio, it's taking into consideration of the past 10 years earning and it's averaging out because every single year as the market continues to evolve, as companies make more and more money, right? The company will make more and more uh, profits, right? That's how the earnings will increase, right? At the same time, they do not want to take into consideration of just one year. They want to take into consideration of past 10 years so that you can have a good 
understanding of the past 10 years performance, right? So when you use the price divided by the 10 years earning, you are able to get the, the PE ratio based on the Schiller PE. So now, right now, can everybody type down for me what is the Schiller PE ratio of the market based on this chart? What is the number that you can see from the chart? Yes, it is 35. So now for those who have been investing, can you tell me 35, is it considered high or is it considered low? High, right? So when it's high, that means the market, it's expensive, right? Anything actually based on PE ratio, right? If it's below 15, if it's below 15, it's considered cheap. Anything above 15, right now, in fact, it's way above 15, 35, it's actually expensive. Now, the thing is, when it's expensive, what does that usually lead to, right? If you can see that back then, based on this chart, right, there was a period of time that the Schiller P ratio shot up all the way to close to 45, 45 times of the earnings, right? Which is really, really stretched, very, very crazy. When did that happen? That was back in 2000 dot com bubbles, right? Now, another time that the earnings stretch up very much, right? P ratio was about 40. That was back in our actually 2022, our recent market crash in 2021, right? Anybody remember end of the 2021? That is the beginning of the bear market, which lasted for one entire year. In the entire 2022, it was a bearish market, right? So over here, these two points showcase to us that Wow, because the market is too expensive, eventually a market corrected. Now, at PE ratio 35, guys, can you tell me, is it quite close to where it used to be? How many of you felt it's a little bit scary right now? If you felt so, type S in the chat. S stands for you felt like, wow, yeah, indeed, uh, based on the past, how many years of data gave you certain clues that it's quite kind of scary right now, right? All right, so now let's continue to look further, all right? So let's get a more data point before we make a decision. Now, the next one, it's based on the fear and greed index. And guys, over here, can you tell me the market, is it very fearful or is it very greedy? They are F or G right now, fear or greed right now. <laughs> All right, the market is greedy. Yeah? So now, for those who have been following this very famous investor, in fact, some of you already named him, right? Warren Buffett, right? Warren Buffett said this, right? Be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. So now, with the market being so greedy right now, what do you think you should be doing? With everybody wanting to get into the market, right? If you talk to maybe friends recently, all of them are like, ah, what stock have you been buying? Wow, I make how much money already? You know, like, like all of them getting very greedy, right? They want to buy more and more. They want to chase the high price. What should you be doing? You should be fearful. That's why, right? During this period of time, a lot of the companies have already stretched up a lot, right? Really overstretched. Um, definitely, right, if they are too overpriced, this is not the best time to go in because if you go in now, the risk of you suffering a loss could be higher, especially if you're looking at very, very short term. So once again, very importantly, as we still need to think long term, but we still want to have a better way of protecting our portfolio, right? Even in a shorter time frame. How many of you think that it makes sense? Okay, you want to protect your profits, you want to protect your portfolio. If this is you, type P in the chat. Okay, P sense of protection. Huh? So how do we protect then? This is what we are going to go through later on as well. Now, Warren Buffett, right? Do you know that there is also an indicator that he wants shed and he actually said that this is one of the indicator that he himself think that it's pretty decent. Right, so he kind of advocated this, right? Out of so many indicators, you only talked about this before, right? And that is called the Buffett indicator. Can everybody type BI in the chat? Okay, BI sense of Buffett indicator, right? So now, this Buffett indicator, what does it represent? Firstly, if you look at the formula, it's using the total US stock market value, right? Divide by the GDP, right? The gross domestic 
product, right? So what does that mean is it's comparing, is it sustainable, right? If the stock market keep on going up, but the GDP lags very much behind, that means uh, it's very expensive. That means the market has gone up too much. On the other hand, if the stock market valuation, it's pretty much similar to the GDP, then you will get a very good number that is small, right? It can be one or even less than one, right? Less than one is even ideal. That means the GDP is more than the stock, mar stock market value, right? This is like kind of like a no-brainer way to invest, right? Because every single thing that in the market is being sustained by even stronger GDP, right? How many of you understand the analogy? If you understand the thought process, can you type you in the chat? Right, you sense of you understand it, right? So very good. With you understanding it, now let's take a look at the current Buffett indicator number today, all right? So based on the stock market value, right? You look at the whole US stock market, it's $54 trillion. However, the GDP, it's only $28 trillion. So that means... We are almost uh, two times of the GDP <laughs> value, right? So whatever things that you're buying right now, it's only sustained by half of it, right? The other half, it's basically coming up so-called from the thin air, right? So now with this, if we plot into the chart, we can also see historically how has this buffer indicator help investors to understand the market sentiment and the situation, right? So as you can see, back in the most recent bear market that we had over here, okay, let me draw out for you guys as well, over here, right? This is the part that we had a very, very overstretch plus two standard deviation. And the chart also told you it's already strongly overvalued if it's above two. Right, so during the 2022, 2021 crash, this is where it was, and then after that, the market really corrected itself. Right, it had to close to a twenty five percent drawdown right from its peak right for the past uh one year plus. Right, so now, if you look at over here as well, the same thing. Uh, when was that? The two thousand dot com bubble. Right, so when it reached the plus two standard deviation, it starts to come down, and then come down very very. Uh, steep, very, very steeply, right? So now over here, right now, we are kind of, how many of you think that we are quite near plus two? If you think so, type plus two in the chat, right? You think that we are quite near to the plus two strongly overvalue standard deviation, right? So what does it show you as well? It shows that, guys, can you tell me what does it show you? What should, what, should you be greedy or should you be fearful right now? Ah, okay. Some of you said be fearful, right? Because we are indeed almost reaching the strongly overvalued zone, right? Which is the plus two standard deviation. Now, the thing is, right? So with all this taken into consideration, right? Let's go on further. I still have more data points that I want to show you. Huh? So how about Buffett's cash? Because, you know, Warren Buffett, he invested heavily in the stock market as well. So if you can see how much cash he, he doesn't invest, it kind of also gives you some clues that whether does Buffett think that right now the market is expensive or does he think that it's very cheap? No, so guys, if Buffett think that the market is very cheap, how many of you agree that he will use more cash? If you agree, type A in the chat, right? If it's very cheap. He will definitely, as a brilliant value investor, he only want to buy things when they are undervalued, when they are cheap, then he will use a lot more cash to buy. So as a result, the cash will be lesser, right? However, right now, Warren Buffett is sitting on a record of $167 billion in cash. So guys, can you tell me, is Warren Buffett holding a lot of cash? Yes or no? Yes, all right. He is, in fact, holding a record high, <laughs> record high, highest number of cash. <laughs> so Warren Buffett basically is sitting like this right now, right? Surrounded by cash every single day. And he doesn't know 
exactly where can he use it well, right? So now, uh, if you see how the Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway is Warren Buffett's company, right? So what is the cash holding level for the past, uh, since 2017, right? For the past eight years, right? Right now, it's indeed record high. It flew, uh, went up all the way to $167 billion, right? It was during 2022 last year, right? When the market, before the rapid recovery, Warren Buffett actually used quite a lot of cash. Can you see that? It can I kind of use quite a lot of cash during that year to buy a little bit more, right? And then right now, the market has gone up so much that he's not buying anymore, right? So now, uh, how how much cash does he have? I just want to give you guys to certain perspective so that you can understand how much cash does he actually hold right now, right? Literally, right, if you use the Berkshire's cash, right, here are the top 10 global companies that he can literally just buy outright. With $167 billion, he can buy the whole entire GE, General Electric. He can also buy Uber. He can buy over Nike, right? With just everything that he has, he doesn't need to take loan, doesn't need to take anything. He can right away buy, right? So how many of you can see the magnitude of his cash right now? If you can see that, can you type me in the chat? Right? He can also buy over AT&T, Sony, Boeing, all this, no problem. Right, so that is the magnitude of cash that he is holding on right now. Right, so now, so that what does that mean? So is it time to sell right now? Right, with Warren Buffett holding so much cash, he's getting so fearful. Well, so as investors, should we be selling, or should we be buying? What should we do? Right, how many of you have a little bit of question mark right now? If you have this question mark in your head, can you type question mark in the chat? Ah, all right. So let's go through further, right? At the end of this, you will have clarity to your question. Now, having said that Warren Buffett's cash holding is a record high right now, right? Record higher. But the thing is, do you think Warren Buffett is selling? What do you think? Do you think he's selling a lot of his shares right now in this so-called overvalue market? What do you think? Yes or no? Do you think he's ma selling massively? Yes or no? What do you think? No. No. Holding. Holding. Now, let's take a look. Huh? How can we know whether is he selling or not? Right? We want to see Buffett's cash holding and it's his stock holding percentage allocation. Right? So, if his cash holding versus stock holding like the stock holding is very little versus the cash holding there's a lot, then obviously he sold, right? Because the stock right now, he holds little, right? On the other hand, if the stock holding is still a lot, then that means he's not selling, right? So where can we find this, right? Actually, the data, it's available online. You just need to Google, right? You just need to Google buffered cash and stock allocation percentage, right? You will be able to find, right? So I found this from Guru Focus, a website that, Everybody free, feel free to use it. It's free, right? So now let's interpret it, right? Most importantly is, do you know how to interpret the charts, right? So over here, the cash to shareholder equity. I accidentally click the next one. Let me go back to the pen, all right? Over here. Am I drawing? Hey, how come I'm not drawing? Ah, there we go, all right? So cash to shareholders equity. Right? So this is the cash percentage, uh, the cash percentage. So from here, guys, can you tell me, right? Buffett used to hold a lot of cash back in when? Back in about 2005 period, right? Before 2005, he was actually holding quite a lot of cash. He was holding almost 40% cash. Can you see that? Right? And then during the 2008 financial crisis, Guys, can you see his cash holding reduced tremendously? Can you tell me why? Why did Warren Buffett use up a lot of cash during the 08 financial crisis? Exactly, right? He went to deploy his war chest and went to buy massively from the stock market, right? Because 
a lot of great companies are being so super, super cheap, super, super undervalued at that time. And so he deployed a lot of cash. And then since then, right, his cash holding has been, uh, you know, growing a little bit, then shrinking a bit, you know, just ding dong, ding dong for a period of time until the highest level that it went was about 35 to 36%. Right, still below the 40%, uh, historically almost 50%, right? Right now it's like uh down there, right? So that was back in the 2021 period, right? So he didn't buy a lot during COVID. However, during the recent bear market, did he buy? Yes or no? Did he buy? During the recent bear market, that means 2022, uh, during 2021 to 2022, that period of time, did he buy? Yes, you can see this, right? Boom, it went down to 20%, right? which is the lowest uh, in the recent years. So right now, his cash holding increased to about 28.77%, which is definitely higher compared to one to two years ago when the market was very cheap, right? But at the same time, can you tell me, do you think that he is selling a lot all the way to the level of Back then, yes or no? Do you think he's selling a lot? No lah, he is not lah. Because if you look at it, right, the average is about here, right? His average, uh, his average cash holding, if you trace back all those points, right, from the low to the high, from the high to the low, actually his average is about 25% around that, right? So right now, he is only slightly above average. So the market is definitely not cheap, but he is not selling, right? How many of you can see this? If you have more clarity right now, can you type C in the chat, right? He's not selling, huh? So guys, let's go on further before we make further conclusion, right? So clear all drawings, next. So how about his uh, shareholders equity? That means percentage of his stock allocation, right? So as you can see, his stock allocation, it's also very obvious, right? It corresponds to the opposite of cash holding, right? So during the 2005 period, before that, he was holding relatively lesser stocks. But during the 08, he bought tremendously and that's why increased, right? Then over time, he continued to make more money, right? He has more cash, right? So then it reduced and now, ding dong, ding dong, it actually Guys, can you tell me uh, over here, right? Over here, 60%. Right now, he's in fact holding 62%. Is it considered high or low in terms of his stock holdings? High or low? Compared to average. Let's talk about average. Uh. Let's not talk about the highest compared to the highest point. Let's talk about compared to average can already. Right? It's actually considered high, right? So if Warren Buffett is not selling, and in fact, he is still holding on to a lot of good companies because that is his way of investing. He only think about long-term and he's willing to hold on to long-term. So what's the fear about, right? So now let's continue to see further. How many of you felt that whatever things I've been sharing with you has been useful so far? It's been useful. Can you type useful in the chat? Is it useful to give you more certainty and clarity in this, I think, uncertain situation, right? So very good. Huh? So now let's learn further, right? Imagine later well, when Ethan comes in, right? Well, the information he's going to share with you will be even more useful, guys. If you, whatever things that you're learning right now is already useful. Huh? So now let's continue to see the holistic chart, okay? The holistic chart, huh? which is the entire portfolio allocation, right? So guys, as you can see, right? The Red line, what is the red line? It's those fixed maturity securities, right? Basically, uh, Warren Buffett used to buy some bonds, right? Bonds means he get fixed percentage of interest, but the return will be a lot lesser, right? Because it's fixed, right? So in a way, you can see that over time, can you see Warren Buffett buys lesser and lesser bonds? And right now, his portfolio uh, barely hold any bonds. That is not significant. Those treasury bills and whatsoever, right? It's not significant. If you can see this, type me in the chat, right? On the other hand, right? What has he been accumulating over the years? He has been just keep on buying and adding more stocks, right? So his percentage allocation from 40% right now all the way already shot up to close to 70%, to 60 plus percent. 
right? So that's why if you look at this right now versus his cash holding, over the years, right, his cash holding has been hovering above about this line, right? So actually right now, uh, his cash holding is actually average. So if you only read the news outside, which the news usually do not give you a holistic picture, they will only tell you, wow, record high, all-time high, right? So when you see news like that, oh, yeah, uh, I think very, very easily you will get per, like swayed a little bit, right? I felt like, oh my God, Buffett holding all-time high cash amount right now. Should I be selling? Right? How many of you felt that? Sometimes you will get swayed by the news. If you feel so, type S in the chat, all right? So that's why, all right? Continue to learn more so that over time you develop an independent thinking instead of being swayed by the news, you look into data points like this to make better informed decisions. All right. So that's why actually it's okay. <laughs> so I was trying to uh, show you guys the transformation. Huh? So now the thing is, just now what we have been looking at, right? All those charts I show you in the beginning of the, of the sharing was all like one year, one year, one year, right? So... But once again, when, it, when, when we want to invest safely, are we looking at short term or are we looking at long term? Guys, can you tell me if you've been following me, you know that I've been stressing on the importance of this long term thinking, right? Because that is the only way that you are going to make money safely from the stock market. You must think long term, right? And if you just look at the stock market for the past 20 years, where has it gone to, right? It has literally just keep on going up because if you are investing in high quality businesses, right? And they will make more money because more and more customers use their products, more and more customers use their services, right? So if you don't do anything, if you just invest in the S&P 500 itself for the past 20 years, you already make 350% gain. How many of you think that this is pretty amazing? If you think so, right? Can you type SPY in the chat, right? SPY is the ticker symbol of S&P 500, right? You can already get started investing by just investing in SPY, right? And if you invest for the long term, your risk uh, is so, so low. At the same time, the money that you are going to make from the market in the long run is tremendous, right? Because it keeps on compounds over time, right? So now, of course, having said that, with this, right, I hope that I give you guys clarity that long term, the market goes up, right? So don't need to be too fret, uh, too fearful about this short term volatility. However, I also do agree that right now, the market is definitely not cheap. So don't jump guns, you know, like suddenly started to start buying a lot of stocks just because all those stocks, share price gone up and you're FOMO, right? Don't FOMO, uh, can everybody type, don't FOMO, okay? Don't fear of missing out because the market has gone up a lot, right? So that's why it's very important that during this period of time, right? Allocate your asset wisely, just like how Warren Buffett allocates, right? So if you still remember, his cash versus equity allocation. Guys, can you tell me what is his percentage allocation? Did he invest 100% of his cash? No, right? So you don't overinvest as well. You don't go and 100% dump into the stock market because that is not the right way. You must have an allocation, not just in terms of your overall portfolio that you need to have different stocks. You should also have cash inside as part of your position, right? So... Exactly, right? Just like what Ian said, about 30% to 70%. Okay, everybody type 30, 70, right? So that's why if we use Warren Buffett as a benchmark, then why not also use his cash holding as a benchmark, right? As a role model, can you raise about 30% cash? And 70% stay invested. Don't try to time the market because nobody ever can. Warren Buffett also doesn't care about short-term volatility. He knows that long-term, whatever stocks that he invests, great companies, go up, right? But at the same time, he's still holding about 30% cash to give himself the bullets. If the market come down, he is going to buy. Right? How many of you understand this? If you understand this, can you type CE in the chat? Okay, CE stands for cash and equity, right? So if you are more conservative, yeah, for sure, you can hold more cash, like 40%, and then 60% and invest in equity as well. 
right? And then secondly, another thing that you can do in this all-time high market, right? For myself, I did this about, I think, two, eight, 2020. Yeah, 2020. Eh, was it 2020 or 2021? Oh, sorry, 2021. Three years ago, right? Three years ago. Because I know that a lot of my assets are, lo are like inside the stock market. And I will say it's locked because I don't want to sell my assets. I don't want to sell my stocks and all this. I want it for long-term appreciation, right? So I know that in the long run, my assets is going to, my the, the portfolio is going to appreciate over time. But at the same time, I want to make sure I guard against my own ignorance because you never know. Sometimes, even though you believe that this market is strong, right, the US economy is sound, maybe some things can happen, right? Maybe a war can break out whatsoever. I don't know, right? So I just want to guard against my own ignorance and protect my portfolio against black swan event. And that's why I also started to invest in property, right? So it's really about diversification. Can everybody type D in the chat? These sense of diversify, right? So especially as your portfolio grows bigger, you should not putting all your money inside just one, one, one uh, class, right? You cannot just be all, all in equity or all in cash, all in bonds. No, it's always about diversification, right? So that's why I diversify into cash, equity, which is stocks. And then I also diversify into property, right? So I calculated based on the amount of cash that I put in, I have about 30%, 30% of my assets is in property, right? Then the rest about 60 to 50% is in uh, stocks. And then the rest of the 10 to 20% is in cash, right? So uh, for me, I felt that my cash level right now, it's not very high. So that's why right now I would not be buying more. I will be using this period of time to raise more cash, to raise until like about 30% and just see what's going to happen in the market. All right. So for myself, this is how I construct my portfolio. And if you have a bigger portfolio, you should also consider that as well, right? Just to diversify and de-risk. Can everybody type de-risk in the chat, right? So that your baskets are, are your eggs are spread into different baskets. And of course, when I'm talking about property, I'm talking about uh, the market that it's generally very, very reliable and very, very predictable, which is the Singapore property market, right? So I invested in my own property uh, just a few years ago. And of course, now over here, right? In regardless which asset class you invest in, be it it's just cash, be it it's property or be it into equity, everything will also be affected by interest rate. Can everybody type I in the chat, okay? Interest rate. Because if you think about it, for the past few years, the Fed has been increasing its interest rate, right? So initially, during the first one year plus, when the Fed keep on increase interest rate, what happens to the stock market? Guys, can you tell me what happens to the stock market? When the Fed just every quarter keep on announcing that they're hiking the rate, they're hiking the rate, the inflation rate is not coming down. So as a result... <laughs> not rice la. <laughs> no, when Fed in increase interest rate, right, the stock market dropped like crazy. And that's why for the past two years, right, the market has been down for so long until human beings kind of become immune <laughs> to the interest rate, then the market rebound back. Right? So can you see the impact that interest rate can have on the stock market? If you can see that, can you type S in the chat on the stock market? Uh? So Recently, actually, FOMC meeting just happened, right? The Fed announced new trend for the interest rate ahead. Now, once again, I am not a professional uh, in this. I'm not professional in this. I do not read too much into the economy data like this. And that's why right now, I also want to bring up the special guest, right? Who is, has been consistently, uh, right, forecasting with 90%, right? I wanted to write 99.99%, but then he said, hey, if you write like that, uh, I'm like God already. I'm not God. Uh. I said, okay, okay, but like you have been very, very accurate in predicting this. And his name is Ethan, right? How many of you have seen Ethan before? If you have seen him before, type E in the chat, right? Because I think I invited Ethan to uh, this community to give sharing for a couple of times. And every single time, he give a lot of value. 
video, he shared with you guys what is the interest rate prediction ahead so that you can better anticipate how it's going to impact you as an investor, right? Into stocks, into shares. And also, if you have a property, how it's going to impact you as well, right? So for myself, I am very, very keen to learn about the interest rate because it will impact me in many ways, right? Not just stock, but my property as well, right? And then at the same time, uh, it will also affect your cash, right? If it has high interest rate, maybe you can also do something about your cash. Maybe you put inside a higher yield account also can, Right, So th this is a very, very interesting topic that will affect different aspects of your life. And that's why I want to invite Kim to come out. And if you guys are ready to learn from Ethan, can you type E in the chat? All right? If you guys are uh, cu curious and eager to learn from Ethan, very good. Huh? So I can see that all of you guys are very excited right now. Now let me bring Ethan up. Hello, Ethan. Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Thanks. thank you for having me. Thank you for the nice <laughs> intro. Arigato, appreciate it. <laughs> no, thank you so much. I know like you are very busy the entire day. You've been helping your clients to, to refinance, to reprice, to do it better. And then um, at night, you still come to join this uh, community call. So thanks so much for your time. I do, I can. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Ethan, <laughs> can you share with us your prediction ahead for the interest rate so that we can have a better clarity as well? Excellent. Okay, I, I am ready. Let me just share my screen over here. I'm going to start by um, going in uh, into the thick of it. All okay, right? sure. So let's get started. Are you guys able to see my screen over here? Uh, right now, I think it's, we are still waiting for your share screen. So it's black. I cannot see it. Yeah, you are, I think it's probably still waiting. Oh, oh yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Where we go? We, got, we, we saw it right now. We saw it. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So uh, I just want to give you guys a very quick update on uh, what happened during this FOMC for people who don't want to stay up at 2 a.m. to watch the whole FOMC. All right. So what happened is, number one, they're going to hold rates at 5.33, which means at this point of time, they leave the rates unchanged. Later, I'll elaborate a little bit more, but I just want to give you guys a, a quick overview and everything first. Uh, they're going to lower the rates before the end of the year. And last time they actually said they are going to cut rates before they reach 2%. So there are two things that we're actually looking at because interest rate right is actually uh, to regulate the entire market so that you won't have too high of an inflation. Just now I actually saw a very interesting question uh, okay. where they are asking about interest rates and the bank um. There was a previous question. Give me a moment. Ah, what's the correlation between bank stocks and current interest rate? This is very interesting because it's one of the cycle ro cyclical ro rotation that we can actually look into. Because um, when interest rates are cheap, their profit margins are higher typically, and because of that, their um their ratios will work to their benefit, and then uh the price should show a higher value. So. The, the two things that they look at, right, is number one, PCE making progress. You can see uh, over here, they are actually making very significant progress from 3.4 to 3% to 2.7 to 2.6 and then now to 2.4. So if this you is, don't mind elaborating a little bit, what is PCE? Personal consumption expenditures? Correct. Personal consumption expenditure. They are looking at both. Uh, the PCE and PCE excluding volatile food and energy. So they are looking at these two numbers before adjusting their predictions. So um, the good thing is why this is important, especially when it comes to our mortgage front. This is important because it's directly affecting SORA rates. Because you can see over here in the MAS um. In the MES document, right, we say it says that MES gives up control over domestic interest rate and money supply. However, domestic interest rates have been typically been below US interest rates. And before we jump into the numbers, I think it is better for us to go through a little bit of disclaimer. Let me just 
explain. I will not be able to advise everybody because everybody's case is very, very unique. And depending on each person, I will be able to try my best to help you save as much money as humanly possible to protect your profits. Okay, so if anybody is excited about protecting your profits, please type P in the chat right now. <laughs> okay? I am very excited. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So what I did, right, in order for us to be able to get a better gauge on where the FOMC results are going to be, what I did was I started comparing the past 19 years of past historical results. These are 4,000 over lines of data. I put it together and I marry the two so that you are able to see this one picture over here. So as the disclaimer says, past performances are not indicative of future results, but 94% is 94% yes. So <laughs> that being said, we can move on to the FOMC results. More importantly, exact to drill down into the one that they actually advise us on where the interest rates are going to be. At this point of time, what I want to do is to take this opportunity to highlight to you guys a little bit of the things that you guys can use as investors to be able to see where the market is going and give you guys a better compass to add this into your arsenal of uh, analysis. Okay, So over here, you can see that Wait, give me a second. Where's my mouse? Ah, okay. Oh, I apologize. One second. Uh, ah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Back. So let me draw uh, one second. So one of the few things you might want to look at is number one, their projection in the change of real GDP on the top right over here. Okay. They are expecting for, do you guys see any recession over here? In 2024, they are not expecting a recession. In 2025, they are not expecting a recession. In 2026, they are also not expecting a recession. So they if are... it's recession, the GB, mm. GDP number will be like negative? They will put something like not so conserved, not so aggressive. You look at the December projections. If yeah. you look at the December projections, right, they have been actually revised upwards. Yeah. Mm. Right? So they have been revised upwards, which is a bullish stance. And the unemployment at this point of time still remains above mm. 4%. Mm. And that's why they come up with the numbers for the Federal Reserve. Okay? So let me clear... Okay. And then the core inflation is also coming down, like projecting yes. dropping to 2%. That's their goal. Correct. And at this point of time, right, their PCE inflation, right, already hit already. 2.4%. Mm. Correct. Mm. Yeah. So that's that being said, we'll be able to look at these numbers to be able to then give ourselves a pretty uh, good guide on where the economy is likely to be headed. Lah. Okay, mm. so today I want to be a bit more structured. I go through everything I introduce. I, I will run through all of this. Uh, please stop me if you have any questions. I will let you guys know what uh you guys need to know. Lah. All right. So, yeah. so the reason why Ethan he is so familiar with the whole entire interest rate is because this is his bread and butter, right? Literally, he he is from unbeatable mortgage. Uh, maybe Ethan, you can have a slide that I, I remember there's a slide that you introduced a little bit more about you and your company, right? Like yes. they, they basically help clients to really know what is the best deal in terms of refinancing and all this uh, through their, you know, their relationship with uh, the banks. They are able to get better deals for their clients and uh, whatever things that they do has a lot to do with the interest rate, right? So they need to constantly see and forecast the interest rate so that to help their clients to get the best deal like, and save, have more savings as well. And I'm one of uh, his, uh, he, I, I, I feel very grateful to him. Later, I will share why. Well, later, I will share why. Ethan, you can continue first. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Uh, um, one thing you were saying, what do you mean aggressive in terms of what figure? What do you mean? Okay. So I move on first. Later, you reply. Then I will, I will talk to you a bit more. Okay. So, um, yeah, do feel free to reach out to us. We are here to help. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about our typical loan structure. Okay, 
number one, uh, the loan structures, right? Usually, right, they are going to give you very nice rates within the lock-in rates. After that, you are going to face what's known as a thereafter rate. Thereafter rates, even right when you're looking at the floating rates, right, they are more expensive as compared to their counterparty over here. Uh, I try to circle. Okay, so they are more expensive than the normal rates over here. So okay. over here, I also want to understand from our audience here, how many of you actually have a mortgage if you have can type M in the chat, right? Then it will be extremely applicable to you. However, mm -hmm. even though you don't have uh, whatever things that what Ethan is going to share will be very useful for you in the future when you are buying your house, right? Because you are definitely going to take on mortgage, right? Like how I take on my mortgage as well, right? So I can see quite a lot of them has mortgage here, right? So they will, maybe some of you wouldn't know because in the past, I also didn't know. I didn't know that I was on this floating interest that is so expensive, right? Then until uh, we can fix it. So this is what Ethan is talking about right now, right? Like that most of the time, banks will offer you fix but maximum like one to two years. Then after that, uh, they you will naturally go back to the floating stage. And the floating is that at the high interest rate, because remember just now, Fed has not started to cut rates yet, right? And they still want to keep it high first. Then maybe until end of this year, they will start to think about cutting for two times, right? That means for the entire year, can I say that Ethan, the, the rates gonna remain high for quite some time, right? Correct. Um, In fact, the reason... The recent one that they actually shared, right, over at the um over at their projections, right? They actually mm. said that interest rates are going to go up. One second, now let me go over ah, to the interest rate going to go no, up again. Sorry, apologies. Uh interest rates are going to be cut, but then they are going to be cut slower. Slower, yeah. Uh if you look at the bottom, right, you can see that the December projection was 4.6, today is 4.6. Mm. But for 2025, the December projection was 3.6, which means they're going to cut a whole percentage point. So they cut four times. Okay. However, now they put to 3.9, which means they only uh... expect to cut three times. Yeah. Okay. Mm, so they're slowing down the rate of the cut. Yeah. So that's why if right now, if, have, if your mortgage is floating, that means your Sora is packed against this, correct? Ethan. Yes. Cor uh, your Sora is going to your Sora is very, very heavily affected by this because of the correlation. Lah. So that being said, uh, what we do, right? Uh, we are able to actually do the prediction. But before that, I want to be able to give everybody a chance to be able to learn something from this by giving you guys the actual timeline when you're buying your property so okay. when you want to do the assessment please do the assessment before dropping your option to purchase okay okay next part i want to be able to tell you what do you do in your building under construction you might want to do you start off with buying the new house then after that you might want to do repricing because uh most of your mm. most of you got some um undisbursed funds that will have penalty but sometimes we are able to get better rates for some of our um higher loan clients uh. and for those of you who are looking for a resale this is the stage that you would go through so what we do in unbeatable we are with you every step of the way okay so a lot of people they are looking at the exit they they are not very sure when they should actually look at the exit however this is one chart that tells you roughly when you can consider the exit. Because when your property is left with 60 years, the maximum you're able to borrow is 30 years. When it's left with 50 years, the maximum you're able to borrow is 20 years. So, Chloe, when your buyer pool shrinks, mm. does your price increase or does it shrink? Decrease, ah. Decrease exactly. So this is where we start to see decay in uh accelerated way. Mm. Alright. So this is when I typically talk to my clients and um plan their exit so that they are able to protect their profits and hold on to as much uh capital gains as they can have. Okay. So 
in order to make this analysis, we do not just look at um, the FOMC rates. We actually look into uh, the BEA, we look into trading economics, we look into a lot of different data points that I am not going to bore you too much with. But one other thing that they do, and the thing is nobody is able to predict interest rates, even Jerome Powell only owns one dot in this dot plot. So Jerome Power is one of these dots. They <laughs> put together after they look at all the data, then they think on how to be able to number one, lower inflation, number two, lower unemployment. So this is what they are having over here. This is their projections. And because of that, then we are able to roughly have an idea of where interest rates are going to go, where Singapore interest rates are going to go just now, I told you it actually follows the US interest rates. So moving on, give me a moment. So what we do, hmm? mm -hmm. yeah, sorry, you were saying? Yeah, so uh, maybe you continue first. Yeah. Okay. So what we do is I I will extrapolate, right, um, the data that we get from FOMC towards the data that we have over here. Okay. And we plot it in into the chart slowly by using the, the data points that they are giving us. And then we do a calculation. After we calculate where interest rates are likely to go. And then what we do is, we are one second. Sorry, uh, my, um, my site is a little bit laggy. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Because mm. I can see it's loaded with a lot of uh, valuable data. That's why the data also very hard to move. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the spinning wheel is happening. <laughs> okay, why not I take over uh, the share screen first? Because I have something that I thought that was very, very important to share out. Because some of you guys may not understand the, the importance uh, of uh, using the way that Ethan just mentioned about, right? to look into your own uh, property portfolio. Why? Because in the past, I also didn't believe. Okay, now guys, I, I also, I, I want to show you uh, how can I help you as an investor, right? Because the, everything is correlated. It's your entire portfolio management. Okay, everybody type P in the chat, right? P stands for your entire portfolio management, be it your property, be it your cash holding and your stock uh, holding as well, right? So, uh, remember just now I talked about I diversify into these three classes. So property actually take up about 30% of my portfolio as well, right? In terms of the cash, I downpay about uh, 300K at that time, right? So, uh, and then at the same time, right? Because I was buying a new condo and the condo is still in the midst of building at that time. So that's why I can only do floating interest, which is the Sora. Right. And when I first bought it, the Sora at that time was very low because the interest rate was very low, right? Due to COVID. However, after I bought, right, wow, in no time, uh, the Fed suddenly start to say that, oh, we are going to increase interest rate. And it really hiked multiple times uh, within one year. And I literally see how it really affected my whole cash flow position as an investor, right? Because I buy that property for investment. So in the end, when I collected my key, I need to pay the entire full, like that means the whole thing kicks in, right? So when I see the whole thing kicks in now, I was in shock right? because the interest rate at that time was 4.59%, right? And because of that, even though my property valuation, uh, it's not very high, it's I bought it for a, a million dollars, right? But because of that, uh, my monthly installment is $4,000, now, some of you may be thinking, hey, but Chloe, you know, you buy it for investment, you can rent out, right? So indeed, I rent it out, okay? In fact, I even did a YouTube video for my for my condo called Momentum Park. So I rent it out and I, 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 I rent out at $3,800, which is considered very high already because I really decorate my apartment super nice, right? But guys, if you think about it, $3,800 uh, is my monthly rental income. But I still have to minus off what? I need to minus off. Firstly, my mortgage is $4,000. And then I need to pay what? I need to pay maintenance fee, $250 because the condo maintenance fee. Ma. And on top of that, I have to pay property tax. Eh. You know, like all these numbers that are something that I was 
never really under my radar until I have my property. Then I realized that, oh my gosh, there's so many things you need to pay, right? So after I calculate everything, right? Net, net, uh, my cash flow, guys. What is my cash flow? I have no cash flow. In fact, I was porting out my, my, my pocket every single month to fork out $750, right? So how many of you felt that it's a little bit sad like that? You know, like you need to fork out cash uh, to own a property. If, if, you, if you think that this is quite sad, right? Type S in the chat, right? So Karen said that, is it only applicable to Singapore market? I think later on, Ethan can address this question, right? So one thing can 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 feel me, right? So that's why when I went to uh talk to Ethan, right? He said that, hey, Chloe, do you know that actually you should really consider refinance your entire property? You shouldn't be using floating rate. Nobody told me that, right? The bankers who, who so-called signed me on, on the floating rate, they are happily collecting 4K from me every month, right? They wouldn't want to tell me this until... Ethan told me, you should refinance it. And because of that, right, after he looked into my situation, and right now, this is the monthly installment that I am paying for my mortgage. Guys, can you type 2.3K in the chat? 2.3K, yeah. How can that help me as an investor? Now, let me show you. Firstly, anybody remember how much is my rent? I collect from my tenant, right? I collect 3.8 and I minus off my mortgage 2.3. I minus off my maintenance 250 and I still minus off my property tax. Everything inclusive. Uh. In the end, because of this one decision that I engage Eden's help, what happened is right now, I'm cash flow positive every single month. $900. So guys, you see the transformation uh, from negative $750 all the way jump to positive $900. And literally, my net change in cash flow position, uh, it's not that I earn extra $900. In fact, I saved that $750. My net cash change position is $1,650. Eh. Guys, how many of you agree this $1,650? means quite substantial to your daily expenses. Literally, you can use it to pay off your grocery bills. You can even pay off some of your family holidays as well. Right? How many of you can see that? You can see that. Can you type S in the chat? Right? See, S stands for savings. Right? That's what I mean by as an investor, you need to be very aware of what are the things that you can do to improve your cash flow position. Because when you improve your cash flow position, guys, this $1,650, Guess what do I do? I invest, right? Because this is the savings that I saved up and every dollar saved means every dollar I can invest in the stock market to increase it even further, to compound it, right? So that's why it's very, very important that in this all-time high situation, uh, you should firstly, relook into your cash versus investment allocation percentage, right? Ideally, 70% stays invested, 30% stays cash, right? And at the same time, right, you should also learn to diversify your portfolio, right? If you can afford to buy a property, I would say that you should actually consider buying a property. Right now, okay, I, but we are not property expert. We do not give property advice. However, if you already have a property, then think about how can you improve your cash flow situation? Because by just that one improvement, I have additional $1,000 plus every single month to invest. And this is just really, that's why I say I'm very thankful to Ethan because of that. I don't feel stressed. Eh? Like literally in the past, I felt like oh, wow, every month I still need to fork out that $700 over dollars just to finance my property. Now I don't have, I have like stress-free property and then my tenant is paying for me and I have the additional cash to invest. How many of you think that this is a, Win-win situation. You think so, can type WW in the chat, right? Win-win situation, right? So that's why I will say that if you have any situation that you are unsure, how can you unlock it to get like by yourself, right? Because a lot of times, banks won't tell you. I tell you the rates that Ethan get for me, right? Banks will never be able to give it to you because they cannot publicize. Uh. Correct, right? Ethan, they cannot publicize, right? All right, strictly no circulation. That's why yeah. I cannot talk about the bank's name. Yeah. So that's why um, 
when you go to banks, uh, you ask, hey, can you give me this rate? They will not be able to give it to you. Yeah, that's why Ethan has been, in fact, he used to be a banker, correct? So that's yes. why he has built up this connection with the banks that only he has, right? He and his team has. So through them, you are able to get a much more, much more preferential rate to refinance and re even consider repricing your, your mortgage. If you are not sure what is the difference, Ethan's team will be best to able to help you. They will explain, look into your situation, just like how they look into mine, and then help you to craft out the best plan, right? And the thing is, they are not just tied up to one bank. There are multiple banks that they are working with and they will only select the best for you. So, yeah. How many banks? Ten. Ten banks, okay? So, they are always giving you the best offer that any bank is giving at that period of time. If mm. those banks, you know, sometimes you stick with your own banks, you always think that your bank's serving you, right? Actually, that's not the case. Actually, other banks are offering better deals, but they won't tell you. But Ethan, he is a third party, right? He is looking at from a holistic point of view and give you the best solution, right? So, that's why if you are thinking about unlocking more cash flow through your property, through your mortgages, I think Ethan's team is the best team that you can uh, look after, look for, right? So Ethan, you, you have anything that you want to add on or maybe address some of the questions, guys. If you have any questions uh, regarding mortgages, regarding refinancing or interest rate whatsoever, please ask it in the chat right now, okay? Um, so that we can help you since Ethan is here. Yeah, so just now, I think, was there any questions? Uh, please give us your contact. Yeah. Uh, Peter, Peter, yeah. fill up this form, fill up this form. <laughs> ah, people are asking, how much is the fees, Ethan? Kosong. <laughs> Kosong, guys. Kosong. Best win-win. <laughs> because you know why or not, Ethan, if you, hmm. if you don't mind sharing, uh, okay, HTTPS, hold on. I'm just going to put... Rebrand.ly, Unbeatable Mortgage. Okay, Unbeatable Mortgage is Ethan's company, right? They specialize mm -hmm. in helping clients to refinance, look into their mortgage situation to give you the best advice to reprice, refinance. And if you don't mind sharing, right? How come you can do this kosong? People are very, this. very curious. I can do this kosong because I have a lot of customers. And the thing is, I'm actually getting a referral fee from the bank. However, I think that that is enough. There has been some cases where I'm tempted to charge, but uh, thank goodness at this point of time, I haven't charged yet. Uh, I might in the future, but at this point of time, it is completely free for me and my team at this point. All right. So, um, yeah, especially for Chloe's community, you will be well taken care of. La. When I... <laughs> so, um, yeah, and later, later I will also start sharing about my predictions on where Sora is going to be and how I can not just use my market research uh, and how I actually extended, how I helped Chloe expand her cash flow until now it is positive cash flow rather than negative cash flow. Happy, happy. And, and yeah, the whole, the whole lot of it, uh, there's quite a lot of um, information, but what I do is I specialize so that I'll be able to help you guys personally so that y'all don't have to go through everything I do because I know that your mortgage sometimes can be very troubling at times. Sometimes, how do you know which to pick? Do you pick fixed? Do you pick floating? Scully, you pick the fixed, then after that, interest rate go down, then you feel salty. Mm -hmm. Or you pick floating, then after that, interest rate go all the way up. Ah, this is some of my clients' experience ah, before they come to me. So... That's why I actually do all I do in terms of research, in terms of understanding the rules to be able to help you guys. Yeah. So that's it. Let me show you guys what's going to happen sure. the next three years. Are you guys excited? Wow. How many of you I want to practice. learn some more and so that you have a better idea how you should be investing in this period of time? Okay. If you're excited, type E in the chat. Right? Mm. So... Uh, okay, so later on, right. we can also uh, answer some of the additional questions. Maybe we just get Ethan to share a little bit more first. Okay, so to answer the question number one, right? Uh, I, I saw one, one question from Elaine, actually. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there is a chat. There is a... Elaine. Uh, Elaine is asking, HDB is always HDB loan. Is HDB loan lowers? HDB, how to refinance? Ah, okay. So depends. 
the question the, the irritating answer i apologize is it depends at a period of time right some of my clients that follow me right actually log into their hdb for 1.5 percent for five years fixed and there are that it depends on what is available at this point of time. Right now, HDB, when you have HDB, right, actually some of the banks, uh, typically uh, the local banks, they will like a little bit more HDB cases and they actually give preferential rates for HDB. LB, at this point of time, not above 2.6. However, those people that were with me, they were experiencing, what, 1.2% for the last three years? Then now they are paying a little bit higher. From 1.2 to 2.6, you save about 1.4. Then from 2.6 to now 2.8 to 3%, you waste about 0.4. So overall, you profit. Lah. But that is if you know how to time the thing. So what I will do is I want to be able to share with you guys uh, how I actually predict where the interest rates are going to go. So if you all are able to see this screen, Chloe, are you all able to see? It's still loading. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So in the meantime, uh, oh yeah, come coming up. Yes. Here. Excellent. I apologize for the lag. I already put in the land, but I will get the 10 GB connection next time. So, <laughs> so in this, uh, in this chart, you'll be actually able to see, right, uh, that interest rates are going to taper down and where interest rates are going to go in terms of the effective federal funds rate are going to be reflected on the top portion as you can see right it's going to reach 4.6 then 3.9 and then uh 2.9 it will eventually and when we translate it to sora numbers right at the end of this year you would be looking at get paying 3.21 for sora plus the spread of 0 0.5 for example the cheapest already that's going to give you 3.7 would you prefer to pay 3% or 3.7? Likely 3. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the next year. Okay. If you're looking at next year, you're looking at 2.55%, which is 2025 December. So mm -hmm. 2025 December, this is when effective federal funds rate dropped to 3.9%. Our SORA is likely going to drop to 2.55 with a 90% confidence interval. Because 94% correlation. Mm. So that being said, right, at this point of time, my opinion, not financial advice, is that the fixed rates look slightly cheaper. And on top of that, right, if your loan size is big enough, right, I will actually have interest rates that are as low as 2.9% plus a one-year free conversion. So after one year, you are able to refresh and change your interest rate to something that is more favorable. And this is optional. How many of you would like to have this option of changing your rates to something more favorable one year later? Yeah, this is like exactly me. also, also Ethan, he helped me get that. I locked in one year fix because at that time I was thinking, hey, should I lock in two years or not? But then Ethan, he used his perspective, how he analyzed the interest rate trend and everything. He said that the interest rate trend is likely going to drop in the next two years, right? Mm. Um, however, right now it's still very high. It's good that you lock in at the lower rate. However, don't limit yourself for two years because what if two years late, down the road, it drops even further, then you lose, like you kind of lose up, right? So right. he said, you lock in for one year and then one year later, you are free to do whatever things again to get a more favorable rate based on that at that time, the market condition. So I was like, wow, that, that, that's a good idea. So yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. And you want no more already, uh, by the way. <laughs> um, I want no more already. Uh. No more already. I apologize. <laughs> Uh, got good deal. That's why I call you, mother. Deal no now no more already. So now this is a new deal. That's why I like to come out into your show and then help everybody save as much as possible. This is what I consider the unbeatable deal, the one that gives you the cheapest interest rates plus give you a free conversion after one year. This gives you the option to change, right? Mm. So this is important. So you look at the three months SORA rates. Just now I mentioned to you guys already, the three months SORA rate will have a spread. This spread, right, at uh, $300,000, the spread is three months SORA plus 0 0.65. 500 is plus 0 0.55. 800 and above is plus 0 
Okay. But guys, if the interest rates are going down, do you want to take the three months Sora or will you want to take the one month Sora? The difference between these two, three months and one month is the average. So if you want your average to go down faster, you take the one month. If you want your average to go down slower, you take the three months. So how many of you will take the one month and how many of you will take the three months? Type down one and three over there. Well, I think this question, uh, like Matt's question, are very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> one. Some of you type one. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> Correct. So one month is the best because if you average 30 days, you are able to see the rates drop faster as compared to if you average 90 days. However, at this point of time, we also have our fixed rates over here, which will be able to then give you your certainty of 3.1. How many of you prefer to pay 3.1 as compared to 4 plus? How many? And if you are able to get the 2.9 above $1 million, I say go for it. And how we help, right? We do very, very simple things. We do three very th very important things. Number one, getting clear on when your exit is going to be. If you're going to sell away your property, uh, you need to know uh, that there are lock-ins that you're in. And what I do, right? If you are intending to sell, sometimes I might tell you, hey, you might either reprice or if it's a bit closer, I might tell you, hey, maybe just hold there after rates. It might be better. And some cases we can move with a waiver of fees due to sale. Every single bank of them, every single bank is slightly different. By understanding how they are different, we use their, the bank's difference to be able to help you. Okay. Second thing that we do is we are going to structure your loans to optimize your cash flow. Okay, so this is exciting because just now I was talking to, just now uh, Chloe was sharing how she saved so much money and then how you get, and then you guys were like, how, how, Ethan, how did Ethan save you so much money? So, we extend the loan tenure. We take our time to pay back the bank because interest rate is very, very cheap. I know this is one of the high times, but hear me out here. At this point of time, when you're looking at inflation and interest rates, right, both of them are roughly about 3%. Mm, so, if you are true. able... Correct. And... People like Chloe, she's able to make 3% in what, one, three months, two months, already done already, right? I, I saw that time you were posting when you're holidaying, you keep making <laughs> money and then you're profitable for the whole holiday. <laughs> then the last thing we do is, last but certainly not the least, we will go and negotiate for the best rates supported by macroeconomic research. So I believe um, this is what we can do to be able to add value to you guys and uh for chloe your community everyone is free how many of you appreciate that it's a free of charge service that means you don't have to pay ethan uh, and his team any money for his help but at the same time you get the best deal out of it right so in the end it's only after he get the best deal for you is the banks pay him right banks pay him uh, not paying not you pay him how many of you love that if you love that type me in the chat right how many of you think that? I think it's very, very nice, right? That's why when 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 at first I was like, hey, Ethan, so how much I need to pay you? He said, Go song. I'm like, huh? Then how you earn? Then <laughs> so he said, because the banks, right, through them, they get customers, right? Because imagine if Ethan never give you guys the, all those options, you probably don't even know that, wow, actually I can do this eh, with this bank, you know? So because of that, banks actually give them their fees, right? To mm. Ethan for bringing in a customer like me, right? So so that's how they they Ethan get remunerated eventually for doing the hard work. Lah. And most importantly is you get the savings because he, of his hard work. So that's why I felt very appreciative to Ethan for helping me. And if you guys also want to get Ethan and his team to look into your situation and help you to squeeze out more cash flow, then you have more time and more money to invest. Uh, then you can click on the link inside the, the Zoom chat, all right? And let me just show you guys when you open the link, what you will see first, right? So that you understand what kind of information that uh, Ethan and his team will also appreciate so that they can also see how they can help you better.
even before uh, meeting you and jumping on a call with you, right? So firstly, um, um, please indicate the best time that they are able to contact you from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And you can you, you can see that they work very hard. Uh, all the way until 10 p.m. <laughs> I salute to you, Ethan. <laughs> it's okay. It's fun. It's fun. Then after that, okay, make sure you fill out your contact details here so that they can uh, reach out to you. And do let them know uh, what is your current stage, right? Are you looking for a new loan? Are you refinancing or repricing? If you really don't know, uh, it's okay. You just write here, don't know, right? So that uh, Ethan's team will be able to dissect your situation uh, when they jump on a call with you, right? But if you know, help you know, yeah, they will help you, all right? And then, uh, please also let them know your preferred date of, so that they can reach out to you, right? Because during the call, they will need to understand your situation, right? And just like how I think at that time it was about, uh, I think close to half an hour to thirteen uh, to forty five minutes kind of call that even mm -hmm. understand my loan situation right now. What is the best, uh, best situation for me? And then after that, he will come back to me again. So so usually it takes about, I think, uh, uh, two, two times of calls so that he can give you the best situation and the best scenario for your case. Yeah. So right. uh, so Sylvia is asking, if the house is already fully paid, uh, can they refinance? The house is fully paid. Can they refinance for private property? Yes. For landed, yes. For HDB, no. Wow. Actually, okay, so I'm very curious. Huh? So let's say mm. for private property, right? Okay, guys, so this is also the QR code. You can, if you don't want to click on the link, too troublesome, you just scan on your mobile phone also can, right? So my question is, let's say it's a private property. Let's say it's a, let's say a landed mm. property. When they fully pay already, they refinance to to do what? So when they refinance, uh, they, they, they fully paid already, right? Yeah. They can do this thing called a gear up. So okay. gearing up, right? Uh, you can actually do that within uh when you have the property under your name without selling lah. Mm. So when it's fully paid already, you are able to take up to about seventy five percent of the valuation as a loan. So for example, if your property price is two million dollars, seventy five percent of that valuation will be at one point five million dollars. So you are able to take out one point five million dollars, but if you use any CPF, for example, you use $300,000 in CPF, mm. then you have to minus that away, then you are able to take $1.2 million out of loan at about 2.9%. Mm. Okay. The free repricing one year later. So so once you have more cash, so it depends on you. Lah. Do you want to use the cash to invest? I know there are certain clients that they might want to use the cash to invest in another property. Because you literally have cash to downpay another property, correct? You can right. also choose to use the cash to invest in uh, another asset class, right? Be it stocks and whatsoever. So that's the flexibility that you have with the cash unlock, right? Because your house is already fully paid, right? So that's the beauty of it. All right. But uh, Chloe, one thing to add, since we are in public domain, certain things need to be a little bit more sensitive. Okay, later I, I will cut away. I will cut away. For no, 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 it's fine. Um, for private properties, right? Correct. Um, you see, uh, for private properties, right? They are able to gear up, but when you gear up, right, you cannot use the money to buy another property. Oh. So technically, technically, uh. you are not able to gear up to buy into another property. But okay. if you were to gear up, because your wife very pretty and you want to give her $1 million, then go ahead. <laughs> okay. okay. I so see. Those that would like to have a more colloquial talk, let's jump onto the line. Yeah. <laughs> My yeah. team and I very well versed. We know all of the rule books and because of that, we know which rules can actually help you guys. To, to not just unlock cash flow, but also for more capital appreciation in the long run, all right? By investing, right? So, so right, now... Very important. Yeah, that's very important. capital appreciation minus away your expense equals to profit. Ma. That's true. I so love this that. Expense. You clear this, you, you lower this, your, your ROI increases. 
Another question from one thing. Uh, if the property is in Malaysia, do you do that? If the property is in Malaysia, at this point of time, unfortunately, I don't deal with Malaysian properties yet. I specialize in Singapore residential. So, um, so any other alternative for fully paid HDB? Mm. Okay. So fully paid HDB, unfortunately, the only way to exit is one of the two. One is sell, second is divorce. Mm. Okay, that's all I can share over here. The, the rest, we will we will bring it offline once again. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys can see offline can have a lot more um, interesting discussion that cannot be held here, okay? But can be offline, no problem, okay? So... <laughs> Uh, Sylvia is asking if bank loans, uh, bank interest rate goes down. If interest rate goes down, does that doesn't mean a fixed deposit will go down as well? Definitely. All right. Mm. The reason why your current fixed deposit, even be it like the TBO and all this, why is it mm. a lot higher? It's because the interest rate is high. However, mm. when interest rate comes down, eventually all those will come down. So right, that's how the banks are able to earn, uh, if not. If not, how are they going to give you a lot of money? But then the, the, the interest rate is very low, right? So that's why it's also very important that you know, not just keeping cash, you must, while right now the cash gives you certain decent return, like 4 5%, but eventually you need to learn how to invest because interest rate is not going to stay here forever, right? The, the, the Fed has already started to hint that they're going to drop cut rate in the next Few, uh, next one year for two to three times. Uh, so you need to learn how to invest as well. Mm. Also, one small point to add. Yeah. Today, Singapore savings bond is lower than my mortgage. It is 3.04% over 10 years. The first year give you 2.95. If you're above 2.9, you can arbitrage. And then you would be profitable for the next nine years if you reprice the one year later. But if you want me to break down, I talk to you again. Ah, okay, 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 guys. So ah. you can see there are ways to literally use a uh, certain vehicle available provided elsewhere to help you to pay your mortgage. Is that what you mean? Mm. <laughs> because you now that they are offering 2.95 after this year, do you think interest rate is going to drop? Right? After this year, when it drops, then every year is profit ready. So some of my clients, they actually did uh, in the height of the pandemic, they actually did a gear up to do a top up. Mm. So there are different strategies. La. Um, your mortgage is like a tool. The better you use it, the easier your life will be. That's true. I, I second that. Because I felt <laughs> that my life yeah. is so much, <laughs> so much more stress-free. You know, at first I really felt stressed. Eh? At that time when you visited me, wow, I felt so stressed. Like, wow, my mortgage, uh, how to cover and all this, right? Even though I invest, I don't want to use my cash. I want yeah. to make sure it's as cash light as possible and ideally give me cash flow, then I can invest more. Right? So, cash flow is yeah. sanity, man. Thank you for, uh, once again. So uh, then, uh, how to know whether is it aggressive or not the one that you mentioned about PCE. So I think the aggressive part is how do you know? Uh, because just now you did mention Fed uh projection mm -hmm. for GDP growth is two percent. So mm -hmm. you think two percent is considered aggressive? I think two percent is normal. Mm. I think it is it is it is not super aggressive, nor mm. it is too conservative. Mm. considering how things will shake out. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So and I think the 2% it's like lukewarm. La, lukewarm. At least it's not very dead. But at the same time, I think the US also do not expect it to grow very fast. So that's why it's a kind of lukewarm kind of standard, right? Correct. And if the interest rates, right, uh, if, for example, right, the 2% don't hit. If mm. they outperform the 2%, this means that maybe there is an inflation problem and then they might keep it for longer. Mm -hmm. So either way, take the cheaper rate, write it out and pay less for mortgage. Mm. Mm. Yeah, more cash flow to invest. More cash, more cash. Yeah. Okay. Any mm. more questions? HDB, we answer already. Uh, Some of you, uh, Casey is asking, what is the minimum amount for refinance? 
The minimum amount for refinance, okay, it depends. For HDB, it's 100K. For private properties, about two to 300K, depending on the bank. Mm. Yeah. So, so any specific situation like this, best to, uh, if you are not even sure, uh, mm -hmm. then I think when you go for this uh, call with Ethan and the team, they will be able to look into your situation and see whether are you eligible first. If you're not eligible, then they will tell you, oh, then, then maybe there are other ways that you can do. But if not, uh, actually, you are good to go already. Like you are already pretty okay, you know. <laughs> All right. All right. So, uh, the Dinesh is asking when is the best time to buy property. Yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Just like when is the best time to start investing? Yes, it's yesterday. Um. So now the thing is because, uh, we are not. I mean, like I'm not an expert in property. Uh, we cannot give, I, I personally don't have any advice I can give it to you right now. But I know, mm -hmm. right, uh, there are also many investing opportunities in the Singapore property market. It doesn't have to be new launch all the time, right? It can be even just uh, resale, right? There are better resale projects that you can look elsewhere. So go and find a reliable uh, agent. If you are not very sure, I think when you apply for the consultation, let's say Ethan, uh, as he's looking through the situation, maybe he can also give you some uh, good recommendation if you really don't have. Yeah, I like to add a little bit on that. I got a little bit of uh, insight to uh -huh. share with everybody. Sure. Number one, why should you buy a private property in Singapore? Singapore very, very small. 726 kilometers square. So the supply is limited because the land is scarce. As a very, very small country, one of the 20th smallest countries in the world, Singapore holds on to very impressive titles. Number one, best business environment for 15 years in a row. Second busiest shipping port in the world. Second only to Shanghai. Um, the end... We always like to back. We have the nicest airport in the world. Now don't even need to use passport. And outside of these, right, Singapore is sheltered from natural disasters, have political stability, affordable tax rates, low crime rates, and good education system and excellent <laughs> healthcare. So personally, my view is, okay, uh, this is not financial advice. Lah. Personally, I feel that the demand outweighs the supply. And because of that, Singapore government is doing a very good job by using HDB to be able to make sure that everybody is able to um, have a roof over their head. And more importantly, right, I believe that in 20 years, right, I believe the land of our scarce resource, which is Singapore land, I think it will eventually go up due to the loss of inflation, supply, demand and everything. So that's what I have to add as a little tidbit to you guys. <laughs> so I mean long term that's why like um, once again we think about long term we can never predict what's going to happen to the property market within the one to two years but decades plan right like I think Singapore mm. is very very safe uh, very investment safe. very safe right like long term hedge at the same time long term capital appreciation and that's why I also diversify my asset remember I bought Singapore property that's that's another reason why yeah ETC and you know yeah and you know what other cool thing? If you look at the value of Singapore dollar, who you mm. <laughs> versus other currencies, who you you see the twenty year chart. I you okay, but <laughs> no way, we're having too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Et say you sound like Jing Jing Hu Lang. Jing Hu Lang. I am by no way associated by Jing Hu. Um, I just enjoy this country, yeah. <laughs> We just appreciate this country. La. I agree. So safe, right? So safe. Yeah. So convenient. Everything is well planned, right? And that's why the property price also well planned. <laughs> well planned. They, they put a lot of constraints to hold it down. A lot. No, that's the most constraints I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. So wonderful, <laughs> wonderful stuff. Uh, Elaine is asking, now is HDB loan higher or bank higher? Bank higher. Mm. Right now, HDB is giving the same old uh, 2.5% plus 0.1, which is a 2.6%. Mm. However, um, when, the more fun question will be, when will the banks be cheaper? Mm. Yeah, because there was two, a long or two, period seven. of time, right? There was a long period of time that banks was like way cheaper than 
HDB for a long time. Yeah, 1.2% you take or you don't want crazy, to take. Crazy, yeah. 1.2% yeah. three-year fix you take or don't take. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, some yeah. of the more extreme ones go for the five years fix and um have been thanking me very profusely. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, wow. Yeah. I wish I bought my house earlier. Ah, then I know you earlier, then I fix it even lower. Okay, <laughs> now I, I'm not complaining because it's way better than my floating rates. Yeah. It's three fixed good rate. I refinanced it last year, December. Question is, wait, wait. Last year, December. Last year, December, we are looking at approximately 3.2%. Yes, Dinesh? Mm. Should be around that. So, um, three-year fixed rates uh, is a little bit challenging because you are not able to move too much. Mm. Personally, at this point of time, when interest rates are coming down, yours is two years ago. So, now is you got two more years of fixed interest rates. Um, the when it decreases, right? You might want to change it, uh, I do not know what is your rate. I am very excited to hear from you soon. I will talk to you offline. I think this this place we let too many people know your financial situation not very good. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I think it's also time for us to wrap it up also. So mm -hmm. once again, thanks everybody for turning up here and thanks Ethan for sharing your massive, massive value. How many of you learned a lot from this? If you learned a lot, can you type down your greatest takeaway from this sharing? Okay, can you type down your greatest takeaway? I'm very curious. Uh, thank you so much. You know, everybody is very appreciative. Okay, but before you guys say say thank you and bye bye, I also want to see what do you learn from this. And we cover a lot uh, for the past one and a half hour from the stock market to property market to mortgage and all this. So what do you learn? Everybody say come <laughs> see only. Et say away your call. Okay, so fill out the phone already. Hey, nobody type your greatest learnings. I'm waiting. Ah, okay. Thank you so much, Wan King. Uh, you are my best student. Stay vested. <laughs> have more cash. Wong Lugi, mortgage with consultation. Very good. There's always something new to learn with the sharing. Thank you so much, Danish. All mm -hmm. right. So, like I said, right? Learn how to smile. <laughs> what? <laughs> hey, I should learn. Hey, when, when you smile like Ethan, you need to squeeze your eyes. <laughs> yeah, because I'm Chinese. You racist like you. 30% <laughs> cash. 70% investment. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Review cash versus stock allocation. I think that's very, very important. Don't over invest during this period of time because the market is high, right? And at the same time, think about how can you unlock more cash flow. If you have already a property, then get Ethan's team to help, right? Because they are really, really proficient in what they're doing and they are able to do it for you right now free of charge all right so that's why okay so see you guys thank you very much everybody have a good thank good you. evening ahead